Okay. I guess I get to be the guinea pig for these 10-minute talks, so I'll get right into it. Um, and what I want to start with um, is actually something that's not on the slide, and want to say that one of the areas that I often uh, <clears throat> communicate with my, uh, discuss with my biochemistry colleagues is a reminder that um, for the nutrition of crops, and in particular uh, of foods, and in particular for minerals, uh, there are no enzymes, no proteins, no gene products that allow any organism to make a mineral. I mean, we can make the phytochemicals, but we can't make the minerals. Those minerals have to be acquired from our environment. And so it's very important to think about the whole system that we're dealing with that move minerals from soils into plants and into our food supply uh, for human consumption. And so the area that I see in this realm that <clears throat> is really the, the most, to me, most pressing uh, knowledge gap um, is information on the impact of climate change. We've already heard some discussion of that this morning. Uh, again, of course, things like elevated CO2, higher temperatures, altered water availability, which could either be an overabundance of water in some areas or, or, or not enough water, and how this climate change affects soil nutrient and in particular mineral nutrient availability for crop plants. We do have some background knowledge in this area. Uh, we know, f um, for example, and, and you saw some uh, data earlier already, uh, soil mineral availability will impact both crop productivity as well as the nutritional quality, the mineral nutritional quality of those foods. You've got to bring those minerals into the plant before they can be moved on into the edible portion of the, of the plant. We also have growing evidence that elevated CO2 levels in particular uh, can lead to lowered soil pH and redox potential. Uh, the soils people, in, 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 in collaboration with some of our, our agronomists and, and plant scientists, have been looking at how um, uh, CO2 levels um, impact the biological component of the soil, which is then having an impact on pH, on redox potential, which can <clears throat> change the dynamics of minerals in the soil. Uh, sometimes causing more iron and manganese, for instance, to get locked into soil particles and then dislodging uh, some of the macro elements like calcium and magnesium, uh, which uh, then can be leached out of the soil. So long term, this can cause problems for the availability to plants. We also have uh, growing evidence uh, from these free air carbon exchange studies, these so-called phase studies, where they go out into a field and have big emitters that release CO2 into the environment around the plants in order to see the effects of that on, on productivity and nutritional quality. And these studies are suggesting that iron, zinc, and protein levels are declining, or will decline in some crops. And again, iron and zinc are two of the most important micronutrient um, concerns that we have for world health uh, issues, uh, because uh, anywhere from a third to a half the world's population is already considered at risk for iron and zinc deficiency. And so what I think is needed is really an integrated understanding of the soil plant ecosystem responses uh, to climate change related phenomena. And so some of the research needs that we uh, are, are, are required for this area and really to move our understanding forward and to fill this gap are really to identify how changes in the physiology and metabolism of, of plant, plant roots, uh, the soil microorganisms affect the soil chemistry and nutrient availability. Um, we need to characterize how diverse soil types respond to these variables and to the crops and the microorganisms. Um, we saw some examples um, um, of, of different soils, but there's so many different soil types out there. I'm not a soil scientist, but I, I know from my colleagues and, and talking with, you know, just reading the literature, we have many, many different soil types, and so how different crops in those different environments uh, we need to really sort of scan that, that whole breadth of, of soils in order to understand how this is going to impact us on a global scale. We need to develop breeding tools, um, genes and markers and breeding strategies to help improve both the mineral uptake from crops in crop plants as well as the partitioning of those minerals into the edible portion of the plant. Um, I think another area that brings us over to the consumer uh, side of the equation and the human nutrition side is that we need an expanded understanding of regional dietary patterns so that we can understand which crops we really need to target in order to either maintain or enhance their nutritional quality. And we need to have a, a very significant impact um, and, and focus on staple food crops because these are the foods that provide the highest proportion of nutrients uh, in our diet. They, they, they make up the most of our caloric intake. And then we need to um, have uh, test various mitigation strategies 
whether it be agronomic practices, improved cultivars, um, maybe we need to shift production regions for certain crops, and I think we also need to bring in food tech approaches where we look at ways to uh, bring in foods of higher nutritional quality uh, through uh, um, uh, food processing, food technology approaches uh, to bring new ingredients in uh, to help improve the nutritional quality of our foods and make sure that we're supplying adequate nutrition to humans. Uh, so I think the impact of this uh, work would be to enable predictions of long-term ecosystem nutritional productivity and really to help us uh, develop best practices for ensuring a nutritious food supply. Um, from a research team perspective, I think we need everyone on the soil side, plant side, human nutrition and soil scientists. And I would also argue that we need to bring in the downstream players that really help agriculture perform out in, in the real world, uh, seed industry, precision ag people, and I've already mentioned sort of the food technology uh, combination and contribution that could be made to this effort. Um, this isn't going to be a short-term uh, effort. It's going to take many years. Five to ten is, you know, maybe optimistic. Um, in terms of resources required, I think we need a, a number, a range of field sites. Uh, we need uh, uh, facilities and resources for controlled environment research. Um, we need to bring in the analytical tools with our field people uh, to be able to me measure the nutritional quality of our foods. Um, in terms of looking at dietary uh, patterns, we need access to population to conduct those surveys. And as we all know, we have a lot of regions of the world right now which are suffering from all sorts of political strife, and so we need to be able to get into those areas to really understand the, the diets. Um, funding, obviously we need funding. And I think the funding sources are, are you know, usual players here from our, our federal uh, sources as well as some of the private sources uh, uh, through some of the foundations and the World Bank. And so just to end then, uh, for those of you who like a more uh, visual representation of this, um, really what I've tried to portray here is that the, the biological components of the soil in combination with the um, environmental impacts on either those biological organisms or the soil itself are going to have a big impact on soil mineral availability. Uh, those minerals then uh, help us both provide a yield of our crops as well as contribute to the mineral content of those plants. That mineral content then leads into what portion of that is partitioned into our edible tissues. And so we need both an adequate uh, food supply as well as a nutritious food supply uh, to really help uh, maintain and, and improve uh, human nutrition. So with that, I don't know how long I spoke, but I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you.